Hey, what's up, guys? You're now listening to Devo with Uncle Theo. Today is day 91, and we're in a new book again. We hit Ruth yesterday, all four chapters in one day. Hope I didn't rush that, and you're able to get something out of that. But now we're moving to 1 Samuel. Now, 1 Samuel is an interesting book because it unlocks a lot for us in a progression of our biblical literacy. We're moving pretty fast now. We've gone from the creation of the world to the fall of man, to the Genesis 3.15 promise that a seed will come and that there will be enmity and war throughout human history. We saw the world got so wicked that the sons of God were coming down and intermingling with the daughters of men, creating Nephilim. God had to flood the earth. We saw the Tower of Babel and God having a confused language. And we saw all of the nations through the table of nation. And even the one that the seed will come through, Shem, which ended up giving birth to a man by the name of Abram. God comes and gives Abram this promise, and he tells him what that'll look like, that he'll have a son. And we went through all of that, the Abrahamic covenant, even to Isaac, to Jacob's name change from one who strives with God to, to God fights for you. The 12 tribes flowing through Jacob in a baby making contest, them being disobedient and intermingling. God having to get them in Egypt so they could become a great nation because we saw people like Judah messing around with Tamar. And we had that story right in the middle of the story of Joseph and they incubated and become a great nation. And it says that then arose a Pharaoh that did not know Joseph. And so God raises up Moses. We get that first generation in the wilderness. He kills them all for their disobedience. A less than a two-week journey ends up being a 40-year journey. He raises up that second generation through Joshua, and they have it going on. They conquer so much, but they make so many mistakes in Joshua. Then it gets the worst that it's ever been, pretty much even worse than that first generation. We saw the culmination of that ending judges, all kind of sin, but God started to give hope again through Ruth, through obedient people, in the midst of a wicked world. And that book ends with David. And the reason I did that summary is because David is our first true king, the one that God wants. But in order to teach Israel a lesson, he's going to first give them the king that they want. And that's what the book of Samuel is about. So first, we're going to look at an introduction to our final judge. Remember, I said there were 13 judges in the book of Judges. But 1 Samuel gives a rise to our last judge. We'll see some interesting things about him in chapters 1 through 3. And I guess I'll go ahead and give the outline of this book. Then we'll cover the arc narrative in chapters 4 through 6. And we're going to transition into the monarchy. And that's going to give a rise to the king that the people want, the king of human choice. And we'll close this book out looking at the preparation of the king of God's choice. And that's what the book of Ruth ended with, that name David. But first, we got to get to him. And God raises him up. And guess how he's going to raise him up? You better believe it. A barren womb. Pay attention to those barren wombs. I keep telling you, God places emphasis on those because he wants to show you how every time he does something special, he highlights this. And he's preparing your mind to pay attention to the womb because when we get to the New Testament, he's going to one up all of that and do something even more special and bring a virgin birth. And this person who comes through the womb will save humanity. But we should have already been training our mind that God has always been working through the womb all throughout the Old Testament. So our theme for this book is going to be kingship. This book is going to give us a theology of kingship. So let's pick up in chapter one. So our people in chapter one is a, a man by the name of Elkanah, and he has two wives. One name is Hannah, and the other name is Paniah. And Paniah has children, but Hannah cannot. She has a barren womb. In verse three, it says, Now this man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas were priests to the Lord there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Paniah, his wife, to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her 
because the Lord had closed her womb. And so this causes Hannah to pray. And that happens in verse 11. It says that she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you would indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me, and do not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come near his head. Now you see that? What is that depicting? A Nazarite, right? That's one of the qualifications of a Nazarite. And so Hannah is tying to that, saying, Lord, if you give me a son, I'll place him under a Nazarite vow and make him a Nazarite. And I was talking about this last time, that this is a foil for Samson. And let me stop and give you a funny story. I got a good friend from Philly by the name of Camille. She always picks on my Southern accent. And it's not too heavy but it does come out sometimes with a lot of my slang words. Like I grew up saying instead of aluminum foil, we would say aluminum foil. <laughs> and, and so this literary term, I've said foil a lot. And she's like, what is a foil? And I say, so you want me to say foil? And she say, yeah. I say, I say oil too, instead of oil. And so we joked about that. And I told her I'm going to work on my pronunciation because when I lived out in L.A., I would always say that I'm doing well. And people was like, I love when you say that because it sounds like you're saying well. And I would joke and I say, so y'all think that I was saying that I'm doing where Jonah was, not a state of being. <laughs> they would say, yeah, we, it sounds like you're saying well, like you're doing well. And so those are funny moments. So don't pick on me too much. But if you ever hear me mispronouncing something, using my Southern slang, hit me up in the comments like my girl Camille did. But let's get back to the text. So she says she'll never use a razor on his head. And it says that she was praying to the Lord and Eli was watching her. As Hannah, she was speaking in her heart. Her lips were moving, but a voice was not heard. And so here's your biblical allowance for silent prayers. Some people are weird about this, that God won't hears a prayer where a sound isn't being made. And we can grab this from narrative. But Eli thought she was drunk. He tells her, put your wine from you. And she replied, no, I'm just a woman oppressed in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before the Lord. And Eli answered and said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant your petition that you've asked of him. She said, let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate. And her face was no longer sad. And her prayers answered. So the Lord remembers her and her prayer was answered. It came about in due time that after Hannah had conceived, she gave birth to a son and named him Samuel, saying, because I have asked him of the Lord. And that's another note. So if you see names ending with El or Yah, those are biblical names pointing to God. For instance, Elijah, Eli, God, my God, Yah, my Lord. So Elijah means my Lord, my God. And in here, El, so Samuel literally means name of God, which speaks to the fact that God had heard a prayer. Now Elkanah went up with his household to offer the Lord the yearly sacrifice to pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up and she said to her husband, I will not go up until the child is weaned. And Elkanah said, hey, do what seems best to you. And this is interesting because that was the same phrase from Judges. The people did what was right in their own eyes. And when they had no king, they did wicked things. He's telling her to do what seems best to her, but she's spirit filled. Her doing what is right in her heart is different from a wicked person doing what is right in their heart. And then you get that famous verse where it says, for this boy, I prayed, and the Lord has given me my petition when I asked of him. And man, this verse here has ministered to so many women who struggle with fertility, who struggle with motherhood, and it has not lost its power. I know many are women who cling to the story of Hannah and for good use. But one thing I want to bring out as we move into chapter two is Hannah's song of thanksgiving. Listen, Hannah's theology is tight. You hear me? Super tight. Like she knows about the seed. She knows about how the world would be made right. The stuff that she says in her prayer here deserves its own sermon. She talks about, she talks about how her heart exalts in the Lord 
There is no one besides him. He is our rock. Let no one boast or be prideful or arrogant, for God is a God of knowledge. The bows of the mighty are shattered. Bows are broken. And she just talks about how everything is turned on its head with God, how the barren person gives birth to seven, but she who has many children languish, how the Lord kills and he makes alive, how he brings the Sheol and raises up. Listen to this. The Lord makes the poor and the rich. There's your dagger to the prosperity gospel. He lifts up the needy from the ash heap. He keeps the feet of the godly ones, but the wicked ones are silenced in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. She's talking about reversal on every level, socially, politically, economically. And she ends by saying, against them, he will thunder in, he will thunder in the heavens. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth and will give strength to his king. Who is that? That's the Messiah. And he will exalt the horns of the anointed. Man, listen, you can pick on these women if you want, but a lot of women have really good theology and we need to honor and respect it. Now, we do need to respect the created order, how God has allowed men to be leaders and place them in a position of leadership and as your main Bible teachers. But we don't need to demean women as well. You have Aquila and Priscilla showing Cornelius the more excellent way. And we just even see that here. What Hannah is articulating is this inspired prayer. And it exalts Jesus to the highest level. Hannah has a big Messiah. And it should force you to question yourself whether your Jesus is big enough. And this is how this question was posed to me. And I pose it to you. Is your Jesus big enough? Do you have to go and try to make all of these social changes, be a revolutionary, or do you trust the Jesus of Hannah's prayer to make everything right? Now, I'm not saying we don't uphold righteousness, but we do need to have a good theology knowing that Jesus will make all of this right if we truly believe Hannah's prayer here in 1 Samuel chapter 2. But this chapter ends with the wickedness of the priesthood, and we know we need a good priesthood but right now the priesthood is bad. Look at verse 16 in chapter two. Eli's sons are eating the fat. But what did we learn in Leviticus 3.16? That the fat belongs to the Lord. And, and so we're going to have to get rid of these guys. They're imposters. Remember Baal Peor when God said that there'll be a perpetual priesthood from the line of who? Who was that? Phineas, right? They don't flow from the line of Phineas. They come from another line of Eliezer, Phineas' brother. So these guys are imposter, and God warns them that judgment is coming. And he does that through his Nazarite, his foil of Samson, Samuel. But Eli is very old, and it says in verse 22 that he heard what all of his sons were doing. They were even laying with the women who served at the doorway of the tent of the meeting. Just reminds us of Baal Peor, what those people were doing there. And so their father does rebuke him, but it says, but they would not listen to the voice of their father. And so the Lord desired to put them to death. And he does this through the very next verse. It says, now the boy Samuel was growing in statue and in favor, both with the Lord and with man. And he raises him up and we walk into chapter three. And he's ministering to the Lord before Eli. And listen to this. And it says, and word from the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were infrequent. It happened at that time as Eli was lying down in the place and his eyesight had begun to grow dim and he could not see. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark was. And the Lord called Samuel and he said, here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called for me. But he said, I did not call for you. Lie down. And so this happens three times. He gets this call three times. And finally, Eli discerns, man, this is Yahweh. So he tells him, all right, if this happens again, go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went to lie down again, and it happens. And he says, speak, Lord. And basically, the Lord comes to him and details everything he's about to do. He says, I'm about to do something 
so severe that everybody in Israel's ears is about to tingle. And that means this is some serious stuff. It's about to get the attention of everybody. And that's what we're about to see tomorrow. He comes back and reports this back to Eli. And Eli tells him, hey, tell me everything God told you. Don't hide anything from me. Be completely honest with me. And he tells him everything. And I love this statement. He says, it is from the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Man, you got bad parenting by Eli. His sons are rebellious. He's allowed them to get out of hand. He's done a rebuke here and there. But the conclusion of the matter, he says, is whatever the Lord wants to do, whatever is good to him, let him do. And that's how we're going to ride out today. It says Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fail. All of Israel from Dan, even to Bathsheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. So we got our new prophet on the scene. We got our new Nazarite on the scene. Camille, we got our foil on the scene. And we're about to see him move. Stay tuned, guys. Let's rock together through 1 Samuel because we're back in narrative and it's about to get good. You guys stay tuned. Catch you tomorrow. <laughs>